last night I told this young lady who has a very prophetic gift, um, but she'll throw down with anybody. I love her, and I can see 10 years down the road, you know, what God's going to do. And I told her, I says, I'll, I'll tell you the analogy that God gave me one day. He says, you're like a piece of antique furniture that has years of lacquer and stain all over it from years of being in the world. He says, if you allow the Holy Spirit to be the lacquer remover and the sandpaper on your life, I will take you down to the grain and I will finish you and I will make you such a beautiful piece of furniture. You'll be used for the master's service. Because a lot of times we get into ministry and we do stuff, we don't even know who we are. You know, we're, we're in our parents' house. We're, we're being raised by our parents, maybe our grandparents, aunts and uncles. And everybody is trying to make us into their image. Well, God wants to re-image you into His image. There's a lot of stuff. The older we are, I believe, when we, when we come to the Lord, the more junk we got to unlearn. You know? I, it, there's just a lot of stuff. And you're like, well, Grandma taught me that. And you're like, well, I love Grandma, but Grandma was wrong. <laughs> I love my Yaya. Um, we were Greek. I went to Greek church. She, we did stuff. You know, we went to church Christmas and Easter, and we did the whole Greek thing. And I grew up thinking all the disciples were Greek. <laughs> Imagine to my surprise when I started reading the Bible, I found out they were Jewish. It's like huh, Yaya was wrong. <laughs> well, you're reading this stuff, and you got it. You got it. Your brain's like on tilt. You're like, well, I was taught this. And the, the interesting thing is my great-great-grandparents, they, they started the Greek church in downtown Detroit. Listen, God has no grandchildren. You can love your family. I have family members that I love that need Jesus, but at certain times I can't be around them. I just can't. I can feel that spirit that they won't acknowledge that they have. And there's a familiar spirit from the family that gets with the stuff if you haven't dealt with it. It's, very, it's a very interesting dynamic. And there's one person in my family, I see him, I see that whatever this thing is, it shapeshifts, and I can see it. Listen, we all, we got to have boundaries with our family members and things that we're into, okay? And boundaries are good. Jesus had boundaries. It says he went off from his disciples and he went to a solitary place to pray. Do not, listen, do not ever mistake doing ministry for spending time with Jesus. You will only get tired. Okay, so I want to read this scripture real first. And today we're going to talk about the heart, the motives of your heart. And then we're going to do the deliverance prayer. And we're going to do communion. How many of you have seen a difference in a good way? When we've been doing the communion and the deliverance prayer. Okay, come on, Pastor. So, if we had a, a baptismal, I'd be like, let's go dunk people. You know, <laughs> Anything that helps you, and nothing should become a ritual. But Jesus tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, do this in remembrance of me. All we're doing is remembering what Jesus did. Okay, so when we go through these things, there may be things that you're exposed to that you read through this prayer. Did you read through this prayer? Maybe last time I was here, it didn't really affect you that much, but now stuff's happened over the next this month, and you read it and you're like, that word just jumped off the page. We'll focus on that. You need to go to 1 Peter, Peter 2.18. You can take that prayer, copy it, it's on the website, you can download it if you lose it or your dog ate it or you dropped it in the toilet. So 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only for the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable because it is of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering, wrongfully for what credit is it when you are beaten for your own faults you take it patiently but when you do good and suffer you take it patiently this is commendable before god for to do this you were called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example as we should follow in his steps why did i read that 
God has instituted all authority whether you like it or not. <laughs> whether you like who the president is mm-hmm. now or before. Whether you like being here. Whether you like your advisor. Who is sandpaper in your life? Because when I was in the world and I told this to people, you ought to be lucky I'm saved because if I went into the world, I'd have taken you out. You got to fight that. You got to fight it because that's your flesh, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about your heart today. Because your heart is wicked above all things. Who can know? I'm going to tell you a story. Last night, um, I had some people. Well, I need to go back. Ten years ago, I went to a women's conference against my better judgment, which I don't normally do, but I went with my two friends because they recommended I go. There are two sisters who used to go with me to juvenile hall. And I am not a frou-frou, tea party, doily lady, if you haven't figured that out yet. If you are, I'm cool with, with you being one, if you're cool with me not being one. It's all good. So we walk in. It was at a hotel in Anaheim. I see this girl laying on the floor, and she's got black hair, and she's got this big old purple swatch in her head, and the Lord just took me right over to her. So I get down on the floor, and I start prophesying in her ear. Don't even remember what I said. Got her name. Sorry, a couple of events. We know some of the same people. Ten years later, I'm sitting at lunch at work, and start talking to this young man. And um, he said, somebody said, oh, do you know that that's so-and-so's brother? And I said, what? Didn't even know. God can have things happen, and you interact with people, and he's setting up divine appointments and divine assignments. Okay. So I go to him a couple days later, and I said, oh, I didn't know your sister was so-and-so. I said, he goes, you know my sister? And I said, yeah, let me tell you the story. So I told him the story, and he goes, oh, that was you? Ten years later. Now, the Lord reconnects us through somebody else. She tells me last night, she says, I was at getting some fast food, and she said, and she knows some of my stories, and she says, I saw this guy walk in, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to go up and pay for his food. And she's like, what, God? You know, this place isn't cheap. So she goes up, and she's standing behind him, and she's watching him work. She's like, because she saw him talking to himself. So she knew something was going on. So he's ordering stuff. She's like, oh, God, I hope it doesn't order the whole menu. So she goes up to him, and she starts talking to him. She goes, well, I want to buy your food. He goes, you're not buying my food. And she looks at him, and she says, well, that's just pride. And I was laughing. And so she jumps in front of him, and she sticks her ATM card in the machine. So she says, I want to tell you about this place called Teen Challenge. He looks at her and goes, oh, do you know Liz? (laughs) And I said, what was his name? She goes, I can't remember. I was like, what? She said, he told me he was a, a family friend of you. So I started naming off these names, and she goes, no. I said, oh, you need to text me. This is how God works. Ten years ago, because I saw somebody laying on the floor that God was dealing with because they were going through stuff. I don't know this person. And I stepped out in faith. Ten years later, God is using people to minister because of one act of obedience. Amen. Listen, what you do is important. What you do here, you may be serving with somebody in 10 or 15 years that is went through here as your roommate that you probably can't stand. But God's going to do something in 5, 10, or 15 years, and they're going to be a totally different person. That's where the metamorphosis comes around. We talked about this being a butterfly. The caterpillar goes into the cocoon, and the liquefaction process happens, and it comes out into a butterfly. But it's the struggle of the butterfly that's coming out of the cocoon that strengthens its wings, because if you help that butterfly get out of the cocoon, the wings will not be strong, and it will be bird food. The trials of this life do not build perseverance when everybody's trying to bail you out. Sometimes it just has to be you and God. That's it. Your mama can't bail you out. Your sister can't bail you out. Your kids can't bail you out. Your grandparents can't bail you out. Your husband can't bail you out. Sometimes you just have to be with you and God. That's it. Your heart needs to be led by the Holy Spirit. It needs to be your intentions, your motive, and your attitude. 
and your heart will eventually catch up with everything. Your mind, your intellect, your reason, and your thought process. Think about what you're thinking about. The stuff that you used to think about five years ago or six months ago, hopefully is different now. Your emotions, your state of well-being, your sentiment. Sometimes when you are living on the streets or you have been in an abusive relationship, you have the tendency to shut your emotions down because this is why there's a lot of girls, I think, that have a lot of eating disorders because they can control what goes in their mouth. Maybe they can't control where they're going or what's happening to them. They're in such an abusive situation. Human trafficking is a big thing now where they're picking these girls up and they're, they're taking them across state lines. Sometimes you're going and taking them through country lines and they're becoming sex slaves. And they have to shut their emotions down because they're afraid. And what I've seen is when you come into a program like this, you've shut everything down for so long, you're actually afraid of what's going to happen when you open the, those gates up. And fear is false evidence appearing real. The fear is a beast. Fear is not from God. See, if God is really a good father like we say he is, why would you be apprehensive about opening your heart up to him? Because he already knows the crap that's in there. And if you just, if you just, Jesus, <coughs> take it. Because at what point in time do you even fathom figuring out how to fix it? Yeah. I didn't. I remember sitting in my living room or laying on the floor saying, Jesus, I don't even know how to fix this. I'm a fixer. I'm the one people call the fixer stuff. I fix stuff. I couldn't fix this. Until we learn how to submit and be obedient. See, obedience is different from submission. We can submit and still have a crappy heart. Yes. To be obedient is Jesus, I love you, I trust you, and I know I can open my heart to you. Because a lot of times people have let you down. Yeah. Mostly men. They've abused you, mistreated you. I know I used to have some girls that would have babies, and they're like, I want to just have a baby so I can have somebody love me. And I would say, a baby's not a puppy, honey. If you don't like it, you can't take it back to the pound. Right. <laughs> you know, I was... I knew what was going on out there, but to actually know 13 and 14 year old girls that are heroin addicts and cocaine addicts that are pregnant, prostitutes, living on the streets. I would go home so mad just at the situation and say, God, these are people that were supposed to protect them. Where are their parents? Where are their parents are drug addicts. Their grandparents are drug addicts. I remember one time this girl told me her father was on death row and that her mother, her grandmother were um, addicts. And I told her, I says, I'm sorry, honey. I said, but there is a way out. Jesus is the way out. So I would start sharing part of my testimony with people and let them know, you don't have to live there. If you're in a pit, ask God to throw you, send you somebody to throw you a rope. Negative emotions of this heart. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. Pride breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Who do you think you are? I get that beast all the time. That's a beast of intimidation. So a proud heart is stubborn and hard. So if you take a candle, or let's say you're, anybody ever do take pottery class? Take a piece of pottery. Hopefully it comes out looking like something. But <laughs> you can take the pottery and you put it into a kiln. But if you put it in there and there's a crack in it, it's baked in there, right? So, or if you take a piece of clay and you put it out in the sun, the sun has the ability to do two things. It can harden the clay or it can soften the clay. The hotter the heat, the softer the clay. Bam. So when it says in the Old Testament God hardened Pharaoh's heart, yeah. it was already hard. 
every act that Pharaoh did in disobedience to God, it got harder and harder. Because when we come, when I say son, I don't mean S-U-N, I mean S-O-N, the son of righteousness. So when we are faced as a believer or a non-believer that comes into interaction with the son of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, that person, you either get down on your face and you recognize him as Lord God and Savior, or you harden your heart. What happened with the ten lepers? Only one came back to say thank you. I don't want to be those other nine. I just don't. I think it's rude. I think it's disrespectful. And it's counterproductive into what God has told me my entire life. I don't. I woke up this morning and I said, God, I really don't understand what's going on here, but you can accelerate this process any time. Today would be good. Doesn't mean I'm going to walk away from God just because He's not walking in my time frame. And where are you going to go? The disciples left Jesus. And he looked at Peter and he said, are you going to leave me too? He says, where are we going to go, Lord? You're the one that has the words of life. What are you going to do? Go back out into the world? It's nasty out there. So what's a hard heart look like? Overbearing? Hardy? Haughty, I should say. This is haughty. She thinks... She just... She just thinks she knows everything. <laughs> Talk to the hand. You know, all that stuff. That's haughtiness. Quit it. And I know some of you do it, and I'm not going to make any eye contact with you because I don't want anybody to start crying. Anyway. H A U G H T. We all did it because we don't want to hear the truth. The truth is a person, and what's his name? Jesus. That's right. We don't want to hear it. Oh, I'm, this is not even half the list. I'm going to leave these notes behind. Domineering, overwhelming, tyrannical, someone who rules oppressive. Someone who is cruel, harsh in manner, without mercy. The one who always wants to control everyone and the place they need to be under their rulership. The opposite of Christ. Come on, we all know we were part of this. You know why? Because we were hurt. Turn to Second Corinthians chapter 2. When you are wounded and you are bruised, you want to control everything because you don't want anybody else to hurt you. But eventually, you'll figure out, Lord, I trusted the wrong people. I'm sorry. I didn't trust the people. Uh, uh, Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore, if anyone has consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being the mindful and having the same love, being one of accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Let each one of you look not only out for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5, Let the mind in you, which is in you, be also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on our earth and those who are under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, you're either going to confess willingly now or you're going to be forced in the age to come. I'm getting hot up here right now, sister. I might start sweating drops on my paper. I heard it in your voice. Ooh. Listen, the Word of God is powerful. A wicked heart. Proverbs 26, 23. Burning lips uttering insincere words of love. A wicked heart is like an earthen vessel cumbered with scum. It's thrown off molten silver, making it to appear solid silver. It's flattery, insincere praise or compliments, has an ulterior motive and concealed motives for manipulation. 
Do you see, see what she's wearing? She's just, I can't believe she's wearing her like that. Oh, I just love your dress, honey. You know, or people say stuff and you're like, and then you turn around to somebody else and say the exact opposite. Oh, yeah. Or if I suck up to somebody, I'll get the good spot next to the pastor. <laughs> Carry my briefcase. <laughs> Sometimes things that I do or don't do are misconstrued by people. I'll give you a couple of examples. I don't turn down help, but in my personal experience, when I see people do things for a person who's in a position of authority that they don't normally do for anybody else. Right. It's just to suck up. Yeah, right, right, right. And it's like, don't you know who I am? Nobody cares. <laughs> and that's that spirit of somebody who's wounded. I gotta be, I want special treatment. Come on now, we've all been there. Hurt part of it, but it's hurt. Yeah, it's hurting people, hurt people. But it's people, I, I know there's rules, but I want special treatment because I was wounded and abused and mistreated. It's like this morning I was getting ready and I said, Dad, you see, you see this going on? Please intervene. Now would be good. Today would be awesome. But in all things, I know I trust you. May not happen today. But he's still God. Let's turn to Proverbs 26, 23. Proverbs is a really good book that will <laughs> rub a lot of flesh with the sandpaper off. It's 23, 26, 23. Okay. 26, 26 is pretty good too, but fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver dross. Let's go down to 26. Through his hatred is covered deceit. His wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Look it, you'll always get busted. You might be able to hide and say all the right stuff and the buzzwords and all that thing, but you can never hide from God. Ever. So just deal with it. Proverbs 15.8 The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. A wounded heart. Psalm 109, verse 22. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Verse 22. Psalm 102, verse 4. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. This is depression. I ain't too many times I forget to eat, okay? But sometimes depression manifests itself as overeating because it goes back to that control. Somebody who sleeps a lot, they opt out by using drugs, they're abused or neglected. So a wounded heart, I'm trying to see how to say this. How's your day? You know, this little Susie Sunshine will come up to you, and you're like, and I'm thinking, and I'm not even seeing Susie Sunshine, because I've got a mission, and i got stuff to do, places to go, and people to see. So Susie Sunshine, because she's over there clicking her little ruby heels together, going, she gets mad at me and thinks, did I do something to offend you? Huh? What are you talking about? Right. You didn't see me over there? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I didn't even wasn't even paying attention. People get offended for that. Yeah. I'm the lady in line at Walmart when the cashier's talking to people, and I'm like, can we please hurry up? I got places to go, things to do, people to see. Um, can I help you bag your groceries? Get out of the way. <laughs> That's me. So the next time you see somebody like that, don't get too offended. Maybe. What do I do about that? I realize that the Lord has all of my steps numbered. I always get the trainee in line who runs out of register tape. <laughs> and the person that writes a check. Price checks. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and the prices are not on anything. Yeah. And I just have to laugh and go. Because you know by the time you get out of this line and get in the other line, the person that was behind you will be going out the door. Mm-hmm. So you're like... Yeah. 
Okay, God, what am I supposed to work here? <laughs> Not necessarily patience, but that person that's working, trying to make a living for their family, has to deal with nasty butt people all day. Compassion. You're learning compassion. There's a couple times where people have gotten crazy with the fast food people. There's one dude, he's yelling at the girl. I go, dude, she makes minimum wage. Go talk to the manager. And he's like, and then they want to come after you. It's like, stop it. She's just a little cashier. Quit it, dude. Yeah. yeah. So you, people. sometimes people are looking for areas to vent their frustration out. Oh, yeah. And at that, little, that little girl working at McDonald's or Taco Bell... What? And she gets wounded. And some big old bully guy comes up to her. Triggers. Yeah. Next thing you know, she's in the bathroom crying. She doesn't quit her job and, you know, stuff like, I don't know why he was so mean to me. Because he's a jerk. Look, honey, you don't know what happened before he got in here. Yeah. Okay. Just like, to try not to take things personally. Sometimes I try and sometimes I fail. So it's all good. That's why we got the cross. Amen. Jesus, I failed. You saw that I failed. Please take my junk. How do you know you're maturing with Jesus? The faster you ask him to take your junk. I've trained myself. What am I supposed to learn out of this situation? What am I supposed to learn? Today, the trials that you go through today is preparation for promotion tomorrow. Tell yourself that. If you can't handle what's going on today, how can you handle the trials that come tomorrow? The trials of today... Our preparation for promotion tomorrow. Because tomorrow always comes. The bill always comes. If we can teach ourselves to be singularly focused and realize it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And though I fail miserably some days, sometimes most days, he's still on the throne. He says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just, and I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not your spouse, not your parents, not your kids, not your job, not your ministry. None of those things cleanse you from unrighteousness. That's just busy work. Psalm 6, verse 6. And talk a little bit about depression. Because depression manifests itself in different ways. Sometimes it manifests itself from being having a sickness, a disease. The depression causes the disease, or the disease causes the depression. We gotta figure out what came first, the chicken or the egg. Both are equally demonic because neither one come from God. He doesn't give sickness and disease because he doesn't have it to give. And I never see Jesus being depressed. <laughs> He had a mission, and on his way to the next place is where he met the woman at the well. Is where he met the demoniac of Gadara. Every place he was going, Jesus stopped to minister because he said, I was always about my father's business. So some people like me, we got to learn to slow down and realize ministry is about people. And some people who are in ministry are so entrenched in the people part that they don't understand there's a business side to ministry. I am worn out from groaning all night. I fled my bed with weeping and drenched my couch with tears. This is King David talking. The dude had issues with depression. Proverbs 17, 22, A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. My research thinks that this is talking about arthritis. Uh, 1722. Really? Yes. A crushed spirit dries up the bones. I believe based on the stuff that I've gone through and some of the medical stuff that God has healed me from. You know, there's some people that teach out there that every sickness and disease is a, is a demon. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, some of the things that I was doing to my body was not, wasn't how God wanted me to do it. I wasn't doing bad things, but I wasn't doing all the good things. Exactly. So, yeah, because there's consequences. Yeah. There's always unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So, like when I eat bread, I know bad things are going to happen. <laughs> so I don't eat it anymore. Or I find better choices. 
life. And the Lord, He says, I set before you life and death. That's a choice you make. Right. Choose life. I can't, I can't be one of those people that eats out all the time. I can't drink soda. I can't do all that stuff. Because it's going to make me sick and it's going to cut my life short. And if my life is cut short, that is not a blessed life. God says, you should live long in the land. Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you're accountable for what you know. And as you gain information and you get gain wisdom, and the Holy Spirit tells you the changes to make, He's going to help you make them. Cheerful heart. What's a cheerful heart look like? Smiling. Happy. Smiling, happy. So happy is a relative term. Contentment. Contentment. Life. People's different definitions of what happiness is. What is God's definition of happiness? Isn't happiness a uh, temporal, what's on earth, and joy is the everlasting, like the real joy of <coughs> what Jesus gives and the world gives the happiness? Yeah, I mean, like a, a lot, the world says, you know, if I go buy this $300,000 Maserati, I'll be happy. Right. Until the new smell gets gone oh, and then I'm not happy anymore. <laughs> When my kids are this age, I'll be happy. And when I get this job, I'll be happy. When I lose 20 pounds, I'll be happy. When I get a you know facelift, I'll be happy. When I can do this, I'll be happy. So look at Hollywood. I'm not happy. Thank you. I used to have a sign in my kids' youth group room that says, Have the attitude of gratitude. For me... Gratitude is, thank you, Lord, you woke me up today. Thank you, Lord, I have a house to live in. Thank you, Lord, I have a bed to sleep in. Thank you, Lord, my kids are healthy. Thank you, Father, because there's already, there's ten other people that are way worse off than me. How can I go and minister to somebody else, Lord, and be a blessing to you? I don't always want to do it. I'll be honest with you. I have a flesh, too. And sometimes with the pastors and leaders and stuff, they act like they walk in that all the time. They don't. And I know this. I don't ever want to be a different person at spiritual emphasis than I am here. I might not ever remember everybody's name because I was I always get bombarded with people I haven't seen like in ten years. I'm like and uh, you know, they got a little less hair. They're a little heavier, a little bit wrinkles, and I'm like, I remember your face. You know, it's like, so I tell people, don't get mad at me. If I remember your face, that's a good thing. Yeah. It's good. There's just like a thousand people there. There's no way. I try, but I fail, so. Hebrews 1, verse 9. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God is your God, and God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So joy is what what was said before is like a quiet contentment. In verse 61 of Isaiah, or chapter 61, verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion... To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61 verse 3. They will be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord so that he may be glorified. So when I was driving down Long Beach Boulevard and that stuff happened with that guy, the first thing I did was I started praying. I knew what it was and it wasn't God. Anything that makes you sick to your stomach, causes you nausea, causes you to try to pass out, makes you nasty, it's not God. It's not God. There's people carrying stuff around. You go to go get gas in your car and you can pick up stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, Jesus, this is what I pray sometimes. Lord, nothing is allowed to attach itself to me. I do not give it permission. And they certainly cannot follow me home. And Jesus, if the UPS guy or the mailman or somebody walking in front of my house has that those critters on them, they ain't allowed on my property either. I do not give them attention, attention, demonic spirits. You do not have permission to be on my property. Mm-hmm. It's funny. When you pray stuff like that, watch what happens. You might not get mail for a couple days. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. You pray stuff and you're like, wait a minute. 
<laughs> Why are they not? And Lord's like, that's what you prayed. I was like, oh. <laughs> you answered that prayer, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> grumbling and complaining heart. Somebody that's grumbling is discontented. They mutter around in a, no, in a low voice that no one else can hear. They complain, they're resentful, they find fault. That means to bring a charge. They are affronted and they are personally offended by everything. <laughs> Come on, we all know somebody like this. <laughs> Some of us okay. know too. <laughs> Nobody in here though, right? <laughs> Oh, honey, I'm so, tired. <laughs> I know. so Joyce Meyer did a study years ago, and she was talking about how some of her business people were having to meet in their living room, and she was going to go upstairs and take a bath, but she wanted to hear what was going on, so she opened up the vent, and she's like, oh, I can wish they would talk louder so I could hear them, and the Lord told her, it's none of your business, Joyce. <laughs> and as I was watching this... And, and listening to her studies and everything, sometimes as wounded people and nobody has fought for us or we think they haven't fought for us, right? we think we have to fight for ourselves. Yeah. All right? So we get combative. Mm-hmm. We complain. And we think everybody really cares about our opinion. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Just killed the sacred cow. Kill the heifer. Okay. And the Lord told me, He says, you, you were allowed to have an opinion. You're just not allowed to open your mouth. Mm. He's like, what? <laughs> you know, Lord, I'm very opinionated. Yes. But doesn't mean everybody wants to hear your opinion. Mm. So I don't know how God talks to everybody in here. <laughs> You're allowed to have opinions. That's why Facebook is a bad place. Some of the useless dribble that's posted on Facebook and the time wasting, it just gets people upset. And it's really easy to hide behind a computer screen. True story. True. Internet gangster. It's like if you... Oh I'm going to use that, sister. You a, in, you a Facebook gangster. Yeah. So, they watch these arguments go on and I've posted stuff. It's like, okay, first of all, this was not even to solicit a comment. I don't even know who you are, so... You troll, you need to go. You need to quit it. And people get mad at me. Sometimes I just post stories for informational purposes. And I it's more for just for information. And I don't I'm not posting my opinion and I have a lot of them. And you know, but then the internet gangsters come out and you're like and then I'll ignore it for a minute and then I'll go. Do I want to get sucked into this vortex or not? Because you can start, and then other people start commenting, and you're like, yeah, and there's all kinds of threads, yep. Yeah. So there's a big thing where I live at, they want to legalize uh, pot stores, so they've been closing them down. People talk smack, and they don't even know me. They're like, oh, you're just anti this, and blah, blah, blah. And I, was, I said, first of all, pot is a gateway drug, so I posted a link with Teen Challenge and other, other ministries. And it's like, that brings bondage. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you get all the trolls out there that want to open pot stores because they want to make money. And I said I said something one time. <laughs> pot stores are just uh, excuses for people that want to get loaded. I said, because if they really had legitimate, legitimate medical purposes, go to a pharmacist. All of our drugs that we have today come from a plant. Sick people need medication, okay? You want to go to a doctor and do all that stuff? That's, that's between you and your God. I don't talk about not going to doctors. I believe God brought doctors to help us. Okay, but when you get, so you get into the, you know, the Facebook gangsters and they start doing these threads and it's like, there's one guy, he just started, and I said, dude, you just showed your IQ, bro, which is not very high. So he's going on and on because people suck you in, mm-hmm. grumbling and complaining. So Numbers verses 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14, 27 through 29. How long will the wicked community grumble against me? <laughs> Have you ever felt like everybody's against you? Yeah. Um, numbers, I'm sorry. 14, 14 27 through 29. Thank you. I have heard the complaints of these groaning Israelites. So tell them, surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do everything that you. I heard you say, and in the desert your bodies will fail. Every one of you 20 years or more will be counted in the census and those who grumbled against me. So here's the thing. 
I don't even remember when I, where I heard this from, but some study. And every time we complain, we're actually complaining against God because if we really believe that He ordains our steps, whether we make stupid decisions or not, who is really the chief complaint against? The Lord. He's like, you're grumbling and complaining. That's why it took the Israelites 40 years to make an 11-day trip. In geometry, what's the closest and fastest way in a straight line to get where you need me to go? And I, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I tell the Lord, I don't get this. I don't understand. But I know God loves me. And I know eventually He'll tell me. But Lord, <laughs> there we go. Numbers 14, 36. So the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. So we're talking about Moses. He sends the spies out. You know, Only Caleb and Joshua came back with a good report. They said there's giants in the land. So they came back. So eight of the ten spies polluted the whole community. And they're like, wait a minute. How long ago was it when we were slaves in Egypt? And they grumbled against Moses because they said, even in, Egypt, even in our slavery, we had food to eat. Do you want to go back to Egypt? I don't. He said, even when you got released from your slavery, God provided manna from heaven, quail for you to eat, parted the Red Sea. You really think these punk giants are going to keep us from possessing the land? Right. Somebody get me a slingshot. Right. Because <laughs> we get caught up with these people that don't follow the Lord or they're not as, I don't want to say it, their walk is not our walk. And they're like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And they start putting all these doubts and fears in you. And you're like, wait a minute. I'm not going to do that. So to complain or murmur means to pour forth curses. Sorry, Lord. Deep, huh? That's deep. So when you're sitting and you're looking in the mirror or you're looking about how far you should be or whatever years you lost or missed opportunities and you start complaining about, Lord, coulda, woulda, shoulda, and you're doing all this other stuff and, and you're like, okay, I can't change that. I can only change today. That's good. And I don't know how much further I would be along. I don't know if I wouldn't have experienced the same things that I did if I had started following the Lord when I was younger. Because I asked the Lord this. Lord, why did you wait until I was 26? And why didn't anybody ever witness to me the whole time in my entire life? And he said, because you wouldn't have listened to him. Amen. So true. <laughs> because the way Christians are now, more is caught than taught. And a lot of Christians are preaching the gospel of salvation, but they're not teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Mm. They can lead you to Jesus, but that's as far as it gets. They don't bring prayer. They don't pray for your healing. They don't bring deliverance. They're not really teaching the word. How many Christians even go out and go street witnessing to people, you know, on the streets? They used to call me the crazy Bible lady in my neighborhood because I always carried a box of Bibles in my trunk. And uh, I don't recommend that you do this. That's my preface. So this is one time this girl, she was hitchhiking. And uh, I had places to go, things to do, and people to see. And I saw her. And I go past the intersection. Lord says, pick her up. That can't be you, God. I don't pick up hitchhikers. So I'm waiting at the light, and he goes, I'll pick her up. Really? So I get to the, I go through the light, and I get to the island where you can make a U-turn. He says, I said go pick her up. And I was like, fine. And I, go, and I go, I pick her up. I find out her name in like a 10-minute car ride. And I said, hey, where are you going? What do you want to do? I, and, you know, I says, I'm a Christian. You know, I talked to her about Jesus a little bit. I says, I want to give you a Bible. So I, dropped, I saw where she dropped her off. I said, my friend's pastor of the church down here. I said, go and check it out. It's right across the street. So how many knows that sometimes we just plant the seeds and other people water it? So don't get all offended. People are like, well, I'm an evangelist. I'm this. Just do what you need to do for whoever's in front of you and don't get caught up in all that stuff. So a couple, a couple weeks.
weeks later, I get a phone call because the irony of this is my house phone number was only one digit off from the church's phone number. So I used to get calls all night. So Pastor James, he called me and he goes, hey, did you, uh, there's this girl Dawn. And I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, she walked in. She came in there. Wow. See, we can't force people to do stuff that they don't want to do. All we could do is say, here's a Bible, go to this church. Because her encounter with me was enough to say, hey, what, I, wonder, I wonder what's really going on with this Jesus. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell her, hey, you know, memorize this 30-pound Bible and I'll check back with you. Can I get your name, address, and phone number? Because I'm going to pray with you right now. Because if I put you down on my little hashtag, because i got to lead 30 people to Jesus this week. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I had to go there. <laughs> Most of the people I pray with, I never even, I, I don't know where they're, maybe I'll know their first name. It's not my job. My job is to preach the word, to pray for people, and to meet them where they're at. And I do it the best I can. An offended heart. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I have cherished sin in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. <laughs> Psalm 66, verse 18. If you have sin in your heart, it separates us from God, right? Galatians. Even if we're believers, just because we're God's kid doesn't mean that sin doesn't separate us. Sin, says, the Bible says, is a stench in God's nostrils. So I give this analogy... Um, if you don't take a shower for a couple days, everybody can smell you, but you can't smell you. <laughs> That's what sin is, right? Yeah. You can't smell your own sin, but everybody else is like, what's wrong with her? Why are you like that? What did I do? God doesn't listen. He loves you. Sin separates you, so you got to clean out your heart. you got to clean it out. An offended heart. An offense. An offense. So let's talk about sports teams. So you have an offense and a defense. The offensive line always goes after. So when you're offended, it's an assault. It's an attack. It's an affront. It causes injury. It's an outrage. Oh, I'm just so offended. Oh, I'm so... you got to make up your mind. You're not going to be unoffendable. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, they had, yo, mama is so blah, blah, blah jokes. And people were like, don't talk about my mama. You know, you can't be offended. Even if somebody talks about your mama. <laughs> just walk away. Because guess what? The enemy knows what buttons to push. He knows you. He's been following you around since you were born. He knows the call on your life better than you do. The enemy has tried to kill me so many times in my mother's womb. My mother tried to abort me. And if she would have been successful, I would not be standing here. Listen, you're not an accident. You're not. Poke the devil in the eye. You may not even know who your dad is. I've never met my father. I'm still here. That's where we learn perseverance. I don't care what I see, Lord. I know who you are. A hypocritical heart is one who pretends, lies, is deceitful. Their actions are false in order to be manipulative, to influence the ones who have favor or potential gain. They act out of selfishness. I'm going to get you. I'm going to pay you back. That whole premise of payback has to stop. Because what you do is you tie God's hands from doing, from acting in righteousness and justice on your behalf. It's not easy. It is not easy. One who pretends lies is deceitful. Their actions are false in order to be manipulative. To influence one's favor for potential gain. They act out of selfishness. Oh yeah, there's always been one at every place I worked at. That's where discernment comes in. Just because somebody's a Christian doesn't mean that they have your best interests in mind and doesn't mean you're supposed to share your whole heart with them. We're not all going to sing around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> We're not all going to sing, I'm in the Lord's army. 
because not everybody wants what's best for me. Mm. Not everybody wants me to succeed. Mm. So I was talking to this girl last night about buying the guy's dinner, and I told her, I said, listen, honey, because she, uh, I, I, she says, I know I'm prophetic, but somebody told me I'm a prophetic evangelist. I said, you can be all things because Jesus walked in all the gifts yeah. of the Holy Spirit simultaneously. Mm-hmm. What you need to remember is you be whatever you need to be, whoever is in front of you. Amen. If you need to evangelize, do that. If you need to give somebody a prophetic word, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, you need to pray for their healing. Yes. It's not about you anymore. It's about the other person. And then God already knows what they need before you do. Yes. So we were talking about secure people in ministry. This Trust me, there's enough ministry to go around. How you can tell is somebody's secure is they're not always trying to tell you everything what's wrong with you. Because people, somebody that really truly loves you and has your best interest in heart, correcting you will be one of the hardest things that they'll ever have to do. Because I've been on both sides. Because you love that person you're serving in ministry with. Look at Paul and John Mark. They parted company for a while, and then eventually they came back together to serve the ministry. Paul even requested him. He says, please send John Mark. He will, he will be much good to me here. So sometimes you got to let whatever stupidity caused you to part ways. It's just time to let it go. A positive emotions of the heart. Got to have a forgiving heart. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. So you said a positive heart. What was the word you gave for that scripture? Forgiving heart. As in 1 John. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. So these are people that... I don't need Jesus. I got nothing to confess. Dude, you're the biggest sinner I know. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you mean, what am I talking about? You're saying, oh, you think you're better than me? I never said that. I accepted Jesus because I was a sinner. It's like the centurion and the Pharisee. The Pharisee says, Lord. You know, I'm thankful I'm not a Gentile. And the Pharisee, the, the centurion says, Lord, forgive me because I know I'm a sinner. Mark eleven twenty six. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I had a huge problem with this scripture about 24 years ago. And I was sitting at my kitchen table. And I said, Lord, this is impossible. You do not know what they did to me. And he says, yes, it is possible. I would never ask you to do something that I did not give you the ability to do. And do you know what they did to me? That's exactly what he told me. And I sat at my kitchen table and I had to make a list of everybody that hurt me, offended me, abused me, neglected me, mistreated me, living and dead. Because you can hold unforgiveness against dead people. (laughs) Or when you're saying, I'm never going to do that when you're a kid, your mom or your grandma does something, and then you grow up and do what? The exact same thing they did? (laughs) And you're like, oh! Because that's a a curse. (laughs) Ephesians 4.32 And become useful and helpful and kind to one another. Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. I have to work at that. I do. Because when you have been abused, mistreated, you develop calluses. And the Bible talks about calluses on our heart. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can take that away from you. I have to work at this. Sometimes not only every day, but minute by minute. I don't ever want you to think that there's somebody on this earth that's arrived. Because they're not. It's not true. It's just not true. You have a discerning heart. Learn to discern. Examine by judicial examination. When you stand in front of a judge, he examines your conduct. To perceive by the Spirit and recognize subtle differences. So when you're discerning, when you discern stuff, sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's spiritual. Just like when that guy rode by me on his bike, I discerned something really wicked. It's a subtle difference. 
Malachi 3.18, and your soul, again, to discern, be, to discern between righteousness and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But by the natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Understanding heart, and then we're going to do a pondering heart. 1 John 5.20, We know also that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding, so that we may know him and what is true. Even the Son of Jesus Christ, he is God and true eternal life. It's in the NIV, understanding heart. So all wisdom and all truth comes from God. And when you understand something, when you ask God questions, it's like when he says you got to forgive people when we're reading about Mark. And I said, God, that's impossible. How do you expect me to do this? And he told me, if you don't do this, I can't forgive you. God wants to forgive us. James 3.13, the one who is, wise in, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show up by his good life, by his deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. How many people will let you follow them around one day and just see how they act during their life? How many people will let you in their house and see if their house is clean? Are their bills paid? Will they let you look in your fridge to see if there's brewskis in there? Just saying. We're held to a higher standard. I'm not talking about perfection. You should always look to please God. A pondering and a meditative heart. Proverbs 4.26 Ponder the path of your feet and your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. If it's evil, don't do it. He told you. Look at the way you're going. If it's evil, go the other way. 426. 1 Timothy 415. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself to good doctrine. Continue in this. For doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. I have no idea who this kid was that she paid for his food the other night at this fast food restaurant. And when I talk with somebody, I'll say, I might not see you again, but I want to see you in heaven. Psalm 77, 12, I will meditate on your works and I will talk of your deeds. God talks about it, likes it when his kids talk about how good he is. The heart of praise. Judah means praise, and it's just to set up a memorial. In Psalm 7, verse 17, I will praise you, O Lord, according to your righteousness, and I will sing praise to your name, the Lord Most High. Uh, Psalm 142, verse 7, bring my soul out of prison, that I might meditate on your name. The righteous shall surround, shall surround me as a shield, for you have dealt bountifully with me. So you have to make a decree or an edict by your authority in order to have peace over your life and to know who you are in Christ. Lord.